So grab your Bible. Let's get ready to say our Bible confession. If you're using the Bible app, then use your phone. Uh, but don't say the Bible confession to your phone. Open up your app. So this is our Bible. This is God speaking to us. Our eyes are open. Our hearts are prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today we make our Bible the final authority in our life so that in every circumstance we will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we are able to come together and worship freely. Help us, Father, to not take that freedom and that right for granted as we come together as one to worship you in song, in truth, and in receiving the word. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would think through my mind and speak through my lips, that you would remove my opinions and remove all of me, and help me to deliver the word that you have dropped in my heart for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, today is Palm Sunday. Yes, it, is. it is Palm Sunday today, Michael. <laughs> Hey, that's good. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit was already working. The only reason I knew that the date was wrong was because I was already preparing to teach on Palm Sunday and Holy Week. So that was just the Holy Spirit confirming that we were all on the same page. I love how the Holy Spirit does that. Um, the details don't matter. So it didn't matter if it was the week he thought or whatever. The point was that was dropped in his spirit and I had already been studying it. So today, um, today actually marks the beginning of Holy Week. And I know sometimes um, being in Christ, we don't necessarily follow all the religious laws, but some of the religious traditions are good. And it's important that we know where they come from and where they are. Okay, so today is Palm Sunday. This marks Holy Week. And Holy Week goes from Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Easter, through Resurrection Sunday, which is Easter. So today we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, and we're going to talk about Holy Week, the events that happen that lead up to Holy Week. So are you ready? Okay, now I hope you came ready, because this is church. This is Bible study, which means... You're going to have to write something down. You're going to learn something. And you're going to learn it in a minute. I hope you brought a pen. Ushers, could you get some pens for when I have you do the other thing you're going to do in a little bit? Just in case someone didn't have a pen, we want to make, their, make sure they're equipped. Okay, so let's turn to Matthew 21. If you don't know who I am, I am Pastor Timberly. I serve alongside my husband, Pastor Andre. And um, like I said, today is Palm Sunday, so we're going to just dive right in. So I'm going to read Matthew 21, and I'm going to read in the message version, because anytime we're talking about history, I just think <clears throat> the message version helps us understand it a little bit better. So Matthew 21, when they neared Jerusalem, having arrived in Bethpage of Mount Olives, Jesus sent two disciples with these instructions. Go over to the village across from you. You'll find the donkey tethered there, her colt with her. Unite her and bring her to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, say the master needs them. He will send them with you. This is the full story of what was sketched earlier by the prophet. Tell Zion's daughter, look, your king's on his way, poised and ready, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, full a pack animal. Okay, sketched earlier by the prophet. Other translations say, took place to fulfill the prophecy. So what prophecy? What prophecy are they referring to? Well, they are referring to a prophecy that happened 500 years earlier. What did Pastor Grady just mention this morning? We don't know our purpose today might benefit someone 50 years from now. Just like, remember, uh, Thelma and Herman, who knew those years prior, them mentoring Ed and Lori was going to affect me today. But God knew that. Okay, so the prophecy they were referring to is found in Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. This is why we come to church, to learn. Okay, Zechariah 9, it says, Shout and cheer, daughter Zion. Raise your voice, daughter Jerusalem. Your king is coming, a good king who makes all things right. A humble king riding a donkey, a mere colt of a donkey. I've had it with war. 
no chariots, no more war horses in Jerusalem, no more swords, spears, bows, and arrows. He will offer peace to the nations, a peaceful world, a peaceful rule worldwide for the four winds of the seven seas. So just as Jesus' birth was fulfilled, Jesus' crucifixion is about to be fulfilled, and his second coming will be fulfilled. So Zion's promised king would come as a servant on a donkey, later to rule as judge in the second coming. And Sister Jewel asked us last week, are you ready? Because one way or another, according to Philippians, every knee will bow to the, knee, <laughs> the name of Jesus. Depends on what you do on this side of heaven. All right, so let's go back to Matthew 21. You guys following me? Okay, Matthew 21, 6. We're, we're picking back up. So remember, they went, they got the donkey. So now verse 6 says, The disciples went and did exactly what Jesus told them. They held the donkey and the colt, laid some of their clothes on them, and Jesus mounted. Nearly all the people in the crowd threw their garments down on the, on the ground, on the, on the road, giving him a royal welcome. Others cut branches from the trees, or some cut palms from the trees, and threw them down as a welcome mat. Crowds went ahead and crowds followed, all of them calling out, Hosanna to David's son. Blessed is he who comes in, the, in God's name. Hosanna in the highest heaven. As, they made, as he made his entrance into Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken. Unnerved people were asking, what's going on here? Who is this? The parade crowded answered, this is the prophet Jesus, the one of the Nazareth in Galilee. So a couple things here. One, it was customary that they would throw garments out so that there would be a, uh, like a holy welcome. So those who had garments threw them out. Those who didn't did the best with what they had. What'd they do? They cut down some branches from a tree. Lesson one, do the best with what you have. <laughs> don't make excuses for what you don't have. We, we heard something last night that was just because you don't have anything, don't do nothing. You've, you do something with what you have. That is why they call this Palm Sunday because they had tore down or cut down palms for the tree and used that for Jesus' entrance. So this is the beginning of Holy Week. Now, some people call this week Passion Week um, because of the passion Jesus had to willingly lay down his life. Others refer to it as Holy Week, examining Jesus' last week here on earth, um, what he did. And, and that's what's important to reference. When Jewel asked last week, are you ready? I want to ask you, if you knew you had one week left to live, what would you do this week? Anybody, give me an answer. Selena, if you had one week to live, what would you do this week? Spend your time with loved ones. Micah. Get things in order. Wait, I don't know your name. What's your name? Cameron, what would you do? Pray for others? Okay. Jewel, what would you do if this was your last week? Okay. Anybody else want to share? All right, then. So we're going to examine what Jesus did in his last week. So, ushers, if you can hand those out, this is where we're going to do some studying. Okay. So what... Uh, you can go ahead and put that um, slide up that I gave you. Okay, so what you see is a Holy Week timeline of what took place during the last week of Jesus' time on earth as walking as human in the flesh. The form you're getting, the bottom part, is blank. That's because you're going to write down the events that took place as we go through it in this message. If you don't write something, you're just reading. If you write something, you're studying. Now, if you choose not to write it, that's on you. But I'm going to help you. So for number one, or for Sunday, Palm Sunday, um, what you want to write there is, uh, you can put the next slide up because in case they need to see it to write it, there you go. Okay, so for Palm Sunday, under events, you're going to write, Jesus' triumphant entry to Jerusalem.
that is the event that took place. We already read the scripture in Matthew. So the way, now this is for you. We're not going to cover all this today, so don't get scared. And don't think I'm going to keep you for a couple hours. We're just going to hit um, one point of each of these events, but I'm giving it all to you should you decide that this is what you want to study this week because this is Holy Week. So we're giving you, you don't know what to study. I'm giving you what to study this week in your personal time with God. That's for you during this time. Okay, so so look at God answering what you wanted. Okay, so as you know, in the Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are all their different testimonies. So what I've done, this is not everything, but this is a good part. What I did was try to give you a little bit of everything um, of how to follow his journey this week. That's what we provided here, okay? So you see for Sunday, I give you the scripture references. We only read one, um, but that's how you would read this if you were studying it on your own. So that's what happened on Sunday. This began Jesus' journey for this week. On Monday, you want to write down, Jesus clears the temple. Okay, this is when Jesus went in and cleared the temple. We're going to read Luke 19. The rest of the scriptures there you can read on your own. Are you guys following me? Okay, so Luke 19 in the New Living Translation, it says, When Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices... He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den, a den of thieves. After that, he taught people daily in the temple, taught people daily in the temple. Remember, he's got a week left on this earth. He taught daily in the temple, but the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. But they couldn't think of nothing because all the people hung on every word that he said. So Sunday, he rides in. They're worshiping him. Monday, he's speaking in the temple, clears out the temple, and the plot to kill him has already begun. Tuesday, look at that list. Y'all think y'all had a week? Look, Jesus had a day. All this happened on Tuesday. Jesus teaches in the temple. So you want to write that down for Tuesday. Jesus teaches in the temple. His authority was challenged. Jesus confronts Jewish leaders. The Greeks ask to see him. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. And in Jesus' teaching daily, he speaks about the future. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to write all that down. And I, and I want you to think about yourself when you think about, boy, I've had a day. I mean, Jesus being Jesus, look at all that transpired in a single day. Still, he taught daily. Okay, so we are going to examine Luke 21. Do you, does anyone need a few minutes still to write that down? Go back to that slide because this is, you know, we're, we're learning, we're studying, we're writing stuff down, we're teaching. Remember we said we only meet once a week. So if this is our once a week and this is our Bible study, then we're going to make the most of this time. So thank goodness we don't run on a clock and thank goodness, you know, we don't have someone telling us to be out at a certain time. So if you need to write it down and get it, then take the time to write it down and get it. This is what we're doing. We're learning, right? Okay. So <clears throat> those are all the things that happened on Tuesday. We're going to read Luke 21. As you can see, there are many more scriptures for Tuesday. So during your study time this week, feel free to read those. Um, Luke 21, verse 5. It says, And some of his disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. But Jesus said, the time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and saying the time has come. 
but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yet these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nations will go to war against nation, kingdom against ki kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all of this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons. You will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Isn't that something? When you're persecuted, instead of wallowing in woe what is me, thinking of it as, wow, this is an opportunity to tell somebody about Christ. What is our Bible confession? That in every circumstance, they would see Christ in us. Every circumstance. So even on your worst day, people should still see Christ. Verse 14. So don't worry in advance about how you're going to answer against the charges from you. For I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you. Isn't this something? Your parents, your brother, your relatives, your friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you. I know some of you feel like these kids are killing me. Everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win souls. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, you will know that the time of destruction has arrived. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. Those in Jerusalem must get out. Those out in the country should not return to the city, for those will be the days of God's, God's vengeance, and the prophetic words of Scripture will be fulfilled. How terrible will it be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days? For there will be disaster in the land and great anger against his people. Boy, this sir don't sound too good. They will be killed by the sword or sent away as captives. To all the nations of the world and Jerusalem will be trampled down like the Gentiles until the period of Gentiles comes to an end and there will be strange signs in the sun the moons and the stars have we not seen those lately and here on earth the nations will be in turmoil perplexed the roaring seas and strange tides people will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when these things happen, stand, look up, for your salvation is near. Then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told the summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things take place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but words will never disappear. My words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of what? This life. Watch out. Don't let your heart be dulled by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware. Sister Jewel said last week, are you ready? Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Every day, again, this is being reiterated, something for us to take note of. Every day, Jesus went to the temple to teach. And each evening, he returned to spend the night at the Mount of Olives. The crowds gather at the temple early each morning to hear him. What a gift that Jesus left all of these instructions. You know, I often think about and have wished <clears throat> that in Lori's last days, she would have had a conversation with us some instructions, <laughs> uh, what she wanted, what to expect. And I remember the last time I went to hospice, I went with the intention of asking her. I was like, I need clarity. Like, I'm a detailed person. I need details. I don't do good with no instructions. 
and um, she wasn't coherent enough for that kind of conversation. And I found myself actually reading to her um, from a book that she loved and a prayer like for her. And I had to re just rely on the Holy Spirit to bring to my remembrance conversations we've had, what she's instilled, her and Ed have instilled in us, the way they've discipled us, things that they've said, referred to cards and letters and encouragement. But what a, a gift that Jesus left to prioritize teaching every day and making sure that certain teachings were taught before he left, which means we should pay attention to those, don't you think? More importantly, like, you know, it's kind of like somebody's last will that's being spoken. You're listening intently. So he's, he's saying these things. Don't, don't let this be caught off guard. Now, the Bible isn't clear about what happened on Wednesday. That's why Wednesday, well, Wednesday is blank. Um, and where the Bible doesn't speak, we don't speak. But what we do know that he did on Sunday was teach in the temple. On Wednesday, I'm sorry. We know that he taught in the temple on Wednesday. On Thursday, he had, we could put that next slide up so they could write that down, um, the Last Supper. As you know, he did the Last Supper with the disciples. He washed their feet. Um, you know, he spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think we've taught on this before about, you know, the disciples knew that's where he went to pray. Do your children or your husband know where you go to pray? Where's your Gethsemane? You know, we have a war room. When I first set up the war room, Trinity was a little younger than she is today. Now she thinks she's grown. And um, when I first made the war room under our staircase, she was like, this might be your room during the day, but at night it's mine. Because she thought it was a nice little clubhouse. <laughs> um, and then I remember Brandon coming home one night in the middle of the night. He worked graveyard at the time. And I w just so happened to have been in the war room praying because I couldn't sleep that night. And he couldn't find me, but he went in there and he opened the door. He's like, Mom, are you in here? And I love that because he knew that if he couldn't find me, that's where I was. So the disciples knew when Jesus went to pray, he was in the Gethsemane. What's your Gethsemane? And do people know where to find you? Okay, so Jesus was also betrayed on Thursday. He was betrayed and he was arrested. I say that's another day. He had a lot going on that day. So we're going to read Matthew 26. So Matthew 26, this is um, during the time of his, uh, the Last Supper. <clears throat> now the Last Supper was also, it was customary for them to observe the Passover. <clears throat> now the Passover, as you all know, that is a, uh, a tradition from the Old Testament law um, reminding the Israelites of being saved. So being saved meaning from Egypt and as you know, the night where the, um, the angel of death passed over, they were to put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and when in those who had the blood of the lamb when the angel of death passed over it would pass those houses and so the lord gave them instructions that they would do a passover meal to celebrate that time for generations to come and so they would have wine and bread and the wine was representation of the blood of the lamb <clears throat> so here jesus is having the Passover meal that we know as communion, but this is where it comes from. It's important for us to know as believers where these things come from so that we don't just do them out of rote, but we do them because we understand what it's about. You guys following me? Okay, so Matthew 26, so he's having the Last Supper. It's called the Last Supper, thank you, because this is his last meal with them, okay? All right, so verse 26, Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Okay, before we go any further, here's another lesson for us. Jesus took the bread and broke it. Then he blessed it. Sometimes we're broken before we're blessed. He broke it first, then he blessed it. 
Some of us, we wouldn't be where we are unless we were broken. Verse 27. Then he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. See, wine's not bad. <laughs> You're just not supposed to be drunk. Okay? He gave it to them and said, now I don't even drink wine, but for all my wine lovers, you know what I'm saying. So he gave it to them and he said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So on that night that he had this Passover meal, the Last Supper, he also washed their feet. I want you to remember all these things. We're going to wrap this up at the end. Serving, that's right. On Friday, write this down, Jesus was tried by the Jewish and Roman authorities. And Jesus was crucified. We're going to read Matthew 26, verse 57 through 61. And again, I encourage you, if you can this week, try to meditate on these scriptures, read them, really get yourself familiar and it shouldn't just be for what we call holy week these are things that we should know as believers this is the foundation of our faith communion which is why we say don't just take communion at church take it at home but the fact that jesus died on the cross is why we say we are christian so we should be remembering this more than once a week out of the year this is why we are a believer Okay, Matthew 26, verse 57. Then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home, the high priest, where the teachers of the religious law and elders had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and came to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and sat with the guards and waited to see how all this would end. Inside the leading priest, the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. Finally, two men came forward who declared, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. All right, this is a lesson for all of us. Just on Monday, they were praising him, throwing down their garments, cutting palms from the tree, these same people bow down to the political pressure, the political pressure, and deserted him just days later. Now, what's interesting, the commentary said, this should be a lesson for us to guard our hearts, our minds, and our spirits against superficial stands as believers. Because the moment that the pressure of this life, economic, political, or injustice happens, what we believe goes out the window. Now that struck a chord with me because as you all know, when we returned to church, the first message series I taught on was the cost of free, because the way Christians responded in 2020 to politics, COVID, and injustice did not reflect who they say they believe. And so to see here that this very thing is what happened the week that our Lord was persecuted because the same people who praised him on Monday bowed down to the political pressures because they were being pressed so they lied I'm sorry this is not the lucky go feely <laughs> message but I mean if we're going to reflect on holy week this is the stuff that really happened and we are living it ourselves as believers. Too many people are saying superficially they are a believer. But when the rubber meets the road, we see what they really believe. Same with what we confess. Oh, yes, we'll praise the Lord, hallelujah, and then we get out there and say something crazy or post something crazy, which is what we're seeing because of all this political pressure, worldly pressure, economic pressure, but that does not define who we are, and we should not allow it. When we do, when we go to that place, we are no different than what happened over 2,000 years ago. So Jesus was crucified. 
Let's look at John 19, 28. Verse uh, 28 says, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put it in hyssop branch, and held it to his lips. When Jesus has tested it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Saturday, there isn't anything specific, so that's why there's nothing written for Saturday, although there are some scripture references for you to read. But on Sunday, as we know it as Easter, is Resurrection Sunday. So we are going to read John 20, 1 through 18. It says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon and Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciples stared out the tomb. They were both running, but the disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in it and saw linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed that the linen wrappings were lying there while the cloth had covered Jesus' head was folded and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. That just gave me chills. Look at this whole week, what this led up to. Verse 11, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stood and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head, the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus was lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave and saw, she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked. Who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, I will go. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Before I, I read, the, well, I'll go ahead and read verse 18. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them the message. Do you know that she was the first to preach the gospel? Because the gospel is the message of Christ. I know for me, that ministered to me when I was being questioned for teaching as a woman. That it was a woman who preached the gospel. For glory to God. Jesus may have had a week, but he ended the week in victory. He ended in victory, defeating death and taking away the sins of the world. So let's just recap this week he had. He enters Jerusalem. He clears the temple. He teaches every day in the temple. His authority is challenged. He confronts Jewish leaders. The Greeks ask to see him. Judas agrees to betray him. Jesus speaks about the future fervently. He has the Last Supper with his disciples, wash their feet, goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. He is betrayed and arrested, tried by the Jewish and Roman authorities, the same people who praised him on Monday. He was crucified, but then resurrected. So I don't know about you, but this is what I took away when I studied this. That in spite of his upcoming death, he continued to teach followers, challenge corrupt religion. He taught the gospel, making the gospel his priority over his need for comfort. He prioritized his relationship with the disciples, teaching them, praying with them, having a meal with them, serving them, washing their feet. He didn't sit and wallow and say, woe is me, my life is coming to an end. Let me stay in here with my parents. He willingly and wholeheartedly kept going. So if you remember a few weeks ago when I shared 
how we and some others felt, what's the use when there's only 10 of us in this room? If we learned anything from Jesus' last week on earth, is to keep going, keep teaching, keep discipling, keep serving, keep giving, keep loving, keep going, keep going. We all said what we would do if we had a week left. I don't think any of us would commit to, well, let me go ahead and go to the church every day. Let me meet with all of the leaders. Let me sow into them. Let me give them some last words of encouragement. No, it was let me handle my business. Let me make sure I'm right with God. Let me spend time with my loved ones. Let me get myself together. My, 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 my. Jesus knew his life was coming again. He taught. He taught. And what impressed me the most or made um, me dig a little deeper was the fact that he prioritized correcting leaders. Paul did the same thing in Galatians. He confronted hypocrisy. And if you remember just a little earlier on, I talked about how the same people who praised him turned their back on him because they gave into the political pressure. Well, Paul confronted hypocrisy, Galatians 2.14. Now, when the, one day we'll have to do a teaching on this because I can't even give it justice in a cliff note version, but, you know, when the Jews weren't getting it, God gave it to the Gentiles. Well, then the Jews got jealous. Now they want it back. Okay? So, but when the Gentiles were saved, the thing is, the Gentiles were not Jews. So they didn't have or didn't care for the same Jewish customs. But you had Jewish leaders that were like, well, if you won't be a part of us, you need to do these things. Well, Paul was addressing that, and he was saying, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like a Jew? Because pretty much what he was saying is you want to force religion on them, but you don't even follow it. But what I like about this is, Paul was saying, when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, meaning that Paul called it out no different than the way Jesus called it out during his last week, which means we need to call it out. And I'm not talking about calling it out in public. I'm talking about we're in relationship with others. If you ain't acting right, I need to be holding you accountable to what you say you believe. That is why we taught the message, the cost of free speech because the free speech that was happening online and outside these church walls was affecting the people inside these church walls. And we gotta call it out in love, but we gotta teach you so that you understand. I didn't know, well now you know. You're held responsible for what you know. But the fact that Jesus prioritized calling this stuff out during his last week, then we should take note of that. Yes, we need to remember what he did for us. We'll never forget. We will never forget what he did for us. Let's not forget what he did his last week. He taught every day. He, cor he corrected or confronted religious leaders. He served, took communion. All of these things are important and things that we should not forget. While we reflect on the life of Christ this week, let's not forget the benefits of the cross beyond salvation in heaven we have wholeness we have healing we have forgiveness we have provision and it may not come the way you want it but the promise is that we have it and you hear us talk about this often whether it's on this side of heaven or in heaven we have it and we're not afraid because we know that our eternal reward will far outweigh the best day here on earth. So don't give in to the pressures of this life, but this week, focus on the life of Christ. What he prioritized this week, go about it as your priority. 
where can you teach every day? And I don't mean you just start preaching religion to every person you see, but you should be teaching the word at home, in your talk, in your conversations, praying over your food, your conduct at work. The way we live speaks louder than what we say. He taught every day. He confronted religious leaders. Communion, a meal. He made time for those who were important. So if we encourage you anything this week, meditate on Christ. Find yourself in his story. 